There's no more women down When they close their eyes Into uncharted skies You're not alone by your life Some old messy guy engagement assistant manager here at OMSI, and I will be your host tonight. I'm super excited to learn more about the geology of national parks and just more fun facts about all the national parks that we have near us. Um, before that, uh, I want to let you know that OMSI is committed to sparking curiosity and igniting imaginations. And to help everyone out at home, we've crafted and curated all sorts of engaging science activities and experiments to inspire you to experience the wonder of science from wherever you are. Visit omzi.edu for more information and resources. And if you do any of the science activities, please send us photos or videos so we can see what wonderful scientists y'all are. I hope you enjoyed tonight's pre-pub trivia and music by local Portland band Rowan and the Billy Goat. They are currently scheduled to perform live inside of OMSI's planetarium as part of our Kindle concert series on January 28th, 2021. You can find more information about this on our website. Uh, putting on these live shows takes a lot of work and we have an amazing partner that helps us make this happen. So a big thanks and shout out to Celestream for providing their live streaming services for tonight's Science Pub. We really appreciate their support. We would also like to welcome you back to the museum to experience body worlds and the cycle of life and tour the USS Blueback submarine. 
Um, advanced tickets are required. The health and safety of OMSI guests and staff is our utmost priority, and we want you to feel comfortable and safe while at OMSI. To meet state guidelines and help limit the spread of COVID-19, OMSI has implemented some changes throughout the museum. Visit omsi.edu for more information. And um, we would love for you to support your local community by putting the pub back in Science Pub. We have some wonderful food and beverage partners around the state that are listed here. So if you're looking for some tasty food or drink uh, to enjoy while you learn more about Oregon's national parks, here's a fun list of partners. Here is what the night will look like, our agenda. Um, it's gonna be pretty similar to our regular science pub. And for those of you who don't know what the regular science pub looks like, we are gonna begin with a National Parks themed trivia game. That'll be a warm up for tonight's talk. Um, so get your horn team together so you can compete and uh, have a lot of fun learning some trivia. After that, we'll have a lecture by Dr. Burns. And then after the lecture, there'll be a Q&A. And for the Q&A, you can submit your questions at any point during the lecture via the comments in our live feed. We'll collect all those. And then after the lecture, I'll ask all y'all's questions to the speaker. If you enjoy tonight's lecture, please consider making a donation or purchasing a Science Pub pint glass. To donate, you can go to omzi.edu slash donate or click the donate button um, on our Facebook page. Before we get to the lecture, it is now time for trivia. Um, this week, I would like to welcome our wonderful life sciences coordinator, Sean Rooney, on to play with all of y'all at home. Uh, hey, Sean, how's it going? I am good, Rebecca. How are you? I'm doing so good. Um, how do you feel about this trivia? Do you think you're going to do like... 10 out of 10, one out of 10? Um, well, I, I'm going for 10. I always go for 10 out of 10. I, yeah. I love national parks. Uh, I like to visit them when I can. So I'm excited. That's awesome. Um, is there anything in particular you're excited to learn about with tonight's lecture? Well, um, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of interested. There's some local national parks that I haven't really explored, like a, um, like the North Cascade. I, um, I haven't been up there. I haven't been the last. And so I'm curious to learn more about those, those areas. Awesome. Yeah, me too. Um, okay, so for trivia, how this will work is um, I will ask a question and give time for everyone to answer. And Sean, that's when you can answer. And if you want to talk through your reasoning, that's always fun to sort of model our scientific reasoning for folks at home. Um, then I'll give everyone the answer to the question before we move on to the next one. So for folks playing at home, if you want to play against the other folks in your household, you can make some stakes, like who's going to play or who's going to do the dishes next or um, who gets to wear a cape. Or, um, I don't know, you make it interesting. Okay, we'll have 10 multiple choice questions. Are you ready, Sean? I am ready. Okay, uh, question number one. Which of the following Pacific Northwest National Parks is the oldest? Is it North Cascades, Olympic, Crater Lake, Lassen, or Rainier? Ooh, um... Well, that's a really great one because I'm not too sure. I think I know the oldest national park in the United States, I think I know, but in the Northwest. Well, I'm going to go with either Crater Lake or Rainier just because I feel like that would have been just impressive and immediately recognized as a place to protect. Um, so I'm going to go with Crater Lake C for that reason. Oh, Ooh. You were very close, though. That was good thinking with that focal point. Uh, it was Rainier, established in 1899. Um, so you were close. I would give you like a half a point for that one. I'll take it. If I was, if I was teacher in this, scoring this. Okay, number two. Which of the following national parks does not have a volcano within its borders or right next to it? North Cascades, Olympic, Crater Lake, Lassen, or Rainier? Wow. Well, initially I thought they all did. So I know Crater Lake is a the volcano, but is it extinct? So does that still count? 
Uh, Lassen. Counts. <laughs> Lassen is, Rainier is. I'm pretty sure there's some in the North Cascades, but I can't think of one in the Olympic unless I'm missing something. So I'm going to go with uh, Olympic National Park. You are correct. Yeah. All right. Um, that's a great picture of a deer hanging out because it's safe to hang out because there's no volcanoes. So relevant photo there. <laughs> um, number three. You're doing great so far. Which of the following national parks has the greatest number of glaciers in the park? North Cascades, Olympic, Crater Lake, Lassen, or Rainier? Uh, greatest number of glaciers. I, I want to say the North Cascades because that's one I don't know much about. Although Rainier is huge, and I would imagine it would have lots of glaciers also. I always um, associate glaciers with, like, more northerly latitudes. Yeah. Something. I like that thinking, Rebecca. So I'm going to go with North Cascades because that one's uh, farther north. I hope I didn't steer you wrong. <laughs> no, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. 2.5 out of 3 so far. Great. Number four, which of the following national parks had a golf course in the park in, 19, in the 1930s? Uh, North Cascades, Olympic, Crater, Lassen, or Rainier? I, wow, I have to say I have no idea. So I am going to imagine it's not Crater Lake. I just can't imagine where a golf course would fit in Crater Lake. Um. Unless it's like a, is it like mini, mini golf, like putt putt? <laughs> <laughs> it, as far um, as I know, it's the regular kind of golf. <laughs> I've never, I've never golfed, so I don't actually know how big of a, I, how much space they need. Do, I, I'm going to go with the Olympic just because in my mind, and I don't really know that it is the less difficult terrain to golf mm -hmm. in. I know, I just, I associate golfing with rich people. Rich people live in cities a lot. Hmm. So, I'm gonna throw that out there. Okay. Um, I'm still sticking with Olympic. It's, <laughs> it's close enough to Seattle. <laughs> it is close to Seattle. There's another one that's close to Seattle too. Um, oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> that's great. Thanks for the, thanks for helping me out. <laughs> <laughs> um, that looks like a gorgeous place to go. I might golf if I could hang out in a place like that. They're showing the same picture I showed. Um, okay, which of the following national parks is closest to downtown Portland? The Redwoods, Crater Lake, Rainier, Olympic, or North Cascades? Closest to uh, downtown Portland. Well... You know, originally I would I would want to say something that's not on here because I would say Mount St. Helens, but I'm pretty sure that's a national monument. Which yeah, it is, um, and you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So out of these, I think Crater Lake's pretty far. I bet. Oh gosh, is this driving distance or as the crow flies? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe go with driving and see. Okay. I believe if I were driving, I could make it to Olympic fastest. I'm, I'm probably off. I bet it's Rainier. Ooh, I'm going to go with the last thing you said, and it is Rainier. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little over two hours. I think Olympic's more like three hours away because oh. it's the last um, Olympia up there. <laughs> Um, <laughs> cool. You're doing great. I already forgot to keep score. So I'm just going to say four and a half out of five. I'm um, going with it. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second half of the questions, which of the following national parks gets the most visitors to the park each year? Most visitors. Ooh, okay. Crater Lake, Rainier, North Cascades, Lassen, or Olympic. This is, you know, it makes me think of that clue that you gave earlier about just being close to a major city, something that would 
uh, or a major airport where it would be likely to get a lot of visitors. Oh yeah. So um, I don't know if that's that's true. I mean, people do go out their way to make it to some more remote, big, spectacular parks. So I'm leaning either Olympic or Crater Lake on this one. I think North Cascade, if I had a guess, or Lassen's probably on the lesser ends. Um, that's just because I haven't been there. <laughs> I You're representative that. of the, the typical. Yeah, that's my logic. Um, so I'm gonna go with on this one, I'm going to go with Olympic. Yeah, it's pretty close to that SeaTac airport, I think. Um, you're right, over 3.2 million a year. Nice. Um, I've been there. When I was there, we got stuck in this like herd of deer with our tent, and they were just chilling, like nice. the tent. It was very magical. That's my report on Olympic. Okay. I agree. Olympic is a really magical place. It's, <laughs> yeah, feels like um, a Number seven, which of the following national parks had the largest volcanic eruption in the past where the ash went the farthest away? To add St. Helens isn't on here. Uh, Rainier, Redwood, North Cascades, Lassen, or Crater Lake? Whoa, look at Redwood popping up into the multiple choice here. It's making a debut. I don't know if that's significant or not. Honestly, I can't remember the answer to this one. Interesting. But I don't, well, largest volcanic eruption in the past. Ooh, any time in the past. Well, I would imagine, I, th I know uh, Crater Lakes eruption of, um, what was it? What's the mountain called? They would like the, um, when it blew, I know that you can find ash like all over Oregon because oh. I've, I've seen it. So, I mean, but ash all over Oregon doesn't seem like really that far away because some, some ash can travel globally on eruptions, right? I think so. Yeah. So, and maybe, maybe Crater Lake when it erupted, they, they go globally. I hope to find that out more. I can't wait till the speaker gets on. So I'm gonna go with Crater Lake E. <laughs> um, you're right, good job. Uh, it was Crater Lake. Uh, awesome, okay. This is wonderful. This is really revving me up to learn all the facts uh, during the talk later on. Okay, we're almost done. Number eight, which of the following national parks has a geothermal area similar to Yellowstone National Park? Is it Crater Lake, Rainier, North Cascades, Lassen, or Redwood? Ooh. Um, yeah, this is interesting. A geothermal area like... Wow, for some reason, I want to say it's Lassen, and I don't know why that bit of information keeps in in my brain keeps wanting to come out. Like there must be a fact lodged. Well, the the, the full like name of Lassen is Lassen Volcanic National Park. Hmm. Yeah, I bet there's something there because I don't remember anything in Redwoods like that. Or it's pretty small too. Right, or Crater Lake or Rainier. So, um, but actually, I haven't really explored much of Rainier. But um, that's really neat. I'm Lassen, let's go with it. Yeah, Bumpus is hell. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that, looks, that looks awesome. Um, okay, your powers of deduction are very scientific. I love it. You're doing great. Um, which national park was formed to preserve the Roosevelt elk? Was it Rainier, Olympic, Lassen, North Cascades, or Crater Lake? Uh, wow, that's funny. Um, cause Redwood's not in here. And for some, yeah, like, that's another one. I, I just think of elk being around Redwoods, but I think there's something about Olympic too in Roosevelt elk. Um, so, again, it's one of those things that I think I know, but I just can't remember what that's about. So I'm going to go with Olympic. I'm going to go with Olympic. Olympic? That sounds like a good answer. Uh, yeah, it is Olympic. Where I saw those deer. Maybe they were elk. No, they weren't. They were too small. But could have seen some elk. Maybe I'll go back and look for them. <laughs> okay. Final question. Okay. Um, which of the national parks has 
had as its greatest advocate when it was formed a person from Portland, Oregon. So someone from Portland, Oregon was a big advocate for this national park. Crater Lake, Rainier, Olympic, Redwoods, or Lassen. Uh, well, um, I don't know. I, I hope I hope to learn more about this one too and who this advocate was. And I feel like I should know about this person because that seems like a yeah. I can't help you at all on this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Important thing. The I, I want to lean towards Crater Lake just because it's Oregon and Oregon. Um, a person in Oregon would advocate for something in Oregon. So I'm going to go with that. Yeah, that's the only one that is in Oregon here, huh? Uh, yeah, Crater Lake. William Steele. Neat. Bridge frame. Is that who the Steel Bridge was named after? Oh. Or was it named after the fact that it's made of steel? I don't know. Maybe we'll learn in the lecture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sean, how do you feel? How's uh, I feel great. I think I think I ended up like uh, eight, uh, eight point five. I think. I I think you did. Yeah, and so I'm gonna round that up to a ten out of ten. So I'm gonna. <laughs> Your goal. <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, can you teach my kids? Uh, you virtually teach my kids. I like you as a teacher. Oh yeah, for <laughs> sure. Yeah, I. You know, I went to read, and we don't believe in grades, so we just always round up to 100. percent Thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate it. That was fun. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, I'll see you later. Bye. Okay. Next up, we are ready for our lecture. I am super excited to learn more about all of those national parks. Um, I would like to introduce Scott Burns, PhD. Dr. Burns is a professor emeritus of geology and a past chair of the Department of Geology at Portland State University, where he's taught for 30 years. He has a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a master's in physical sciences from Stanford University and a PhD in geology from the University of Colorado Boulder. Dr. Burns specializes in environmental and engineering geology, geomorphology, soils, and quaternary geology. In Oregon, his projects involve landslides and land use, environmental cleanup of service stations, slope stability, earthquake hazard mapping, the Missoula floods, paleosols, loose soil stratigraphy, radon generation from soils, and the distribution of heavy metals and trace elements in Oregon soils and alpine soil development. Whew, that is a lot, um, and that all sounds amazing. Uh, are you ready, Dr. Burns? I am ready. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All just right. fine. Can, you can you see uh, the, the screen? Uh-huh. And but it's not moving from the to the next to the next. Oh, here. I know how to do that. Okay. Yeah, you got I'm it. Ready. Yes. I knew you could. Um, wonderful. Well, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. So take it away, Dr. Burns. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, and uh, thanks for the introduction, and congratulations to Sean. You, I love your reasoning. I, I'm the guy who wrote the, the questions tonight, and so all the answers will be done tonight, and hopefully other people did well, too, uh, and you'll enjoy that. So uh, I'm excited to give, you, give this talk tonight on the national parks in the Pacific Northwest. I'm going to define them based geologically, because we have two of them in California, and I'll explain that in just a second. Uh, my mission in life to get, uh, get people outdoors and to observe the geology wherever you are. Wherever you are, Mother Nature is shouting out to you. And everywhere uh, there is a story geological. And for us in the Pacific Northwest, wh wherever we go, there are so many stories and it's so exciting uh, to be able to do that. And we're blessed with six national parks that are up here. I think uh, part of the American heritage that we have got uh, coast to coast. Many of them are in the West and they are just really, really neat. I teach a class every year at Portland State. I've been doing it for 28 years uh, and in the spring. And so if anybody's interested in taking the class, you can do that. If you're over 65, Portland State has a deal. You can take classes for free. Uh, and so at the end, I'll give you my email address if you, um, if you want to get, get more information on, on getting that. So uh, and and uh, Sean, you were again very very good. Uh, uh, Mount St. Helens is a national monument. Uh, the John Day fossil beds, the Newberry Crater, uh, and uh, are are also uh, examples of national monuments. They're small national parks. They're still part of the national park system, but they are uh, smaller. And there are 61 national parks uh, that we have got 
in North America and also one in the Virgin Islands and one in Samoa. So that's good. So let's get started and talk a little bit uh, about our national parks. Oops. All right. There we go. Uh, and, and so the different parks that we have got, uh, North Cascades, which is up in northern Washington, Olympic, which is out on the Olympic Peninsula, Mount Rainier, which is only two hours from Portland. Everybody thinks the closest national park in Oregon is Crater Lake. No, it's five hours down there. Crater Lake and then Redwood National Park and Mount, uh, and then Mount Lassen that we have got. Uh, and all of this is dictated by the fact that we have a plate off of the coast. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. Uh, the Juan de Fuca Plate, uh, off the coast, 200 miles off, we have a, a chain of volcanoes at the bottom of the ocean, creating a plate. Uh, periodically, they erupt, and that magma, the rate of magma coming out get, dictates the rate that it's moving. It's moving four and a half centimeters a year as it is moving in a northern uh, and, and easterly direction, whereas North America is moving in a westerly direction. What happens is, off of the coast, you have Cascadia Trench, and what will happen is uh, the Juan de Fuca Plate and the Gorda Plate down south uh, will be uh, uh, being subducted underneath North America. They come down, they melt, and come back to the surface as a chain of volcanoes from uh, down in California, Mount Lassen, all the way up to Mount Garibaldi up in British Columbia. Uh, and so that is what I call the Pacific Northwest because it's dictated by the Juan de Fuca and Gorda Plate and Cascadia Trench that we have got. So let's start. What I'm going to do is uh, uh, I'm going to start out first uh, the three major volcanic parks, Mount Rainier, Crater Lake, and Lassen. Uh, and then I'm going to go up to Olympic, the North Cascades, end up with Redwood. So Mount Rainier w uh, was the fifth national park out of the 61 national parks. Uh, it goes way back to 1899. It is the 18th most visited park with over a million people every year. It's the largest volcano in the lower 48 states. It's a 14 or 14,000 feet high. Uh, and uh, it's the fifth highest mountain in the lower 48 states at 14,419 feet. Where did the name come from? Uh, it was named by George Vancouver, the famous explorer who was out in the Puget Sound. He saw the beautiful mountain and his good friend, uh, Rear Admiral Rainier, uh, he said, Peter Rainier, I'm going to name it after him. And we did not use the Native American term, which is Tahoma, which is Snow Mountain. Uh, its last major eruption was 6,600 years ago to about 5,700 years ago. It's about 1 million years old. So the oldest eruption, uh, it started erupting just about that time. And it, and Sean, you were talking earlier, it has lots of glaciers. It does. It has 26 named glaciers on it. It's the single, it's the greatest single piece glacial system in the lower 48 states, but it only has about one cubic mile of ice. All right. So here's a picture of Mount Rainier with the glaciers on it, Reflection Lake, which is an absolutely beautiful place. And then the subalpine forest that is in front of it. Or we, as you fly over it, if you fly up to Seattle, a lot of times you'll go over or very close to Rainier, look off in the distance. You have Mount, um, Mount St. Helens over here and then Mount Adams over here, all part of the Cascade Range. And look at all the glaciers that you have here. To get to it, all you do is hop on I-5, go up to, to the Morton turnoff, go over to Morton, and then you get it two hours and 15 minutes and it will get you to the uh, entrance to Mount Rainier. Uh, which is absolutely just beautiful there. And so it is the closest park that we have got. Uh, in each one of the parks, I'm going to show you a little map so uh, you can go visit it. You come in and the Nisqually entrance, which is down here on the left-hand side, uh, and then you take the, high, uh, the road up to Longmire, uh, which uh, is, the, is one of the visitor centers. It had hot springs there at one time, but the hot springs have gone cold. Then you go all the way up to Paradise, and the, the park is normally open all year long up to the uh, Paradise. Uh, Paradise was named by uh, Longmire, who started the hot springs down here, his wife. She loved to go up there to the top, especially in mid-July with all the Indian paintbrush out there. She said, this is truly Paradise. Uh, then you can go through in the summertime to Stevens Canyon, over to the Ohana Pakash Valley, and the uh, Ohana Pakash a visitor center down there, the, the uh, forest of the patriarchs, which I'll show you. 
And then if you go up north, you can get up to the White River entrance, uh, White River Visitor Center, Sunrise Visitor Center that is there. Uh, and that is probably the most visited one because many people from Seattle go to that one. And then they look down on the Emmons Glacier. So these are some of the major glaciers that we're going to be talking about. Emmons, the biggest one. Uh, a carbon glacier up in north, the lowest glacier in the lower 48 states. And it's, it's covered with debris, hence the name uh, carbon. Uh, and then you have got the Nisqually Glacier, which is down. We've been studying its retreat for over 100 years. Cotts Glacier and Tahoma Glacier is on the southern part. You have to beware of those because they have a periodic, every couple of years, outbursts of water that is stored up in the glacier come down into the uh, uh, campgrounds that are down there. So that's kind of the map that you have got. Uh, once you get up to Paradise, you have the Paradise Inn. It's closed right now. Um, it, right now in the park, the roads are all open, but most of the visitor centers are closed in the Paradise Inn, uh, which is a great place to, to visit uh, in the summertime. It's there. Inside, it's got old, uh, old growth trees. It is beautiful. Great dining room. Lots of college students that are there. Beautiful place to go. Wintertime, it looks like this. It's closed. So it really doesn't open until June-ish. Uh, and then it closes in the, the fall that is there. So if we go back in time, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, uh, when the, after the National Park Service had been originated, they started saying, we need to get a lot of people into the parks. Early days, they would uh, ride through in horse-drawn carriages, but they also did things like golf courses, and Mount Rainier had a golf course in it in the 1930s. It's been taken out because we are going more back to uh, the uh, wilderness type of areas. If you're downtown Seattle, there's a Space Needle off in the distance. Mount Rainier dominates it because it's such a huge volcano and it's absolutely beautiful. If you get up to the top, there is a crater and you fly over it. And this is a result of the last eruption that one uh, about 6,000 years ago. Uh, if you go down uh, underneath that, there are ice caves. And sometimes if climbers are climbing to the mountain and all of a sudden a whiteout uh, comes in, takes over the top of the mountain, what happens is they have ice caves that they can go into uh, because there is, there is steam coming out all the time, melting the ice that is formed on the top. If you climb the mountain, generally you go halfway up the mountain uh, the day before, two-thirds of the way up the mountain, up and camp the night at Camp Year, and then you climb the rest of the way uh, the next morning uh, and get off of the top of the mountain and get back down before the potential of uh, thunderstorms comes in later on in the day. Here is a view from Sunrise, the Sunrise Visitor Center, looking up on uh, Mount Rainier. Absolutely beautiful, ice, stunning, and great hiking in the area. And then if you look off the left-hand side, You've got the Emmons Glacier, which I'll show you. I love this time of the year because all of the vine maples are starting to turn color, very, very reddish and absolutely beautiful colors this time of the year. But in the middle part of the summer, as you get up in the Paradise area, look at all the Indian paintbrushes that are out there, the bistorts uh, and lots and lots of flowers as you go up through what we call the forest tundra ecotone up into the upper areas. Another one of my favorite places on the east side of the park, this, this old growth forest, the Grove of the Patriarchs down in Stevens Canyon. Uh, and then now most of the, the geology that we have got there on, on Mount Rainier, as many of the other volcanoes, is andesite. Uh, it's a volcanic rock. Uh, here in the Pacific Northwest in Portland, we got basalt, basalt, basalt. It's black. Andesite is mostly gray. Uh, that you've got. But then there are a couple smaller eruptions on Mount uh, Rainier from small vents. And these, these are basalt flows that have come down. And then the basalt flows have, flo uh, have actually formed into columnar joints uh, that you see here. One place you can see that is uh, Narada Falls. And here's a picture of Narada Falls. And uh, there is lots of columnar joints sticking out from the bottom. This is on your way up to Paradise from the Nisqually entrance. Uh, Ohana Pakash Valley on the other side, a beautiful river that is going down on that side. Here is a drawing showing the, the mountain. Uh, today it's 14,000 feet high, but it was way a couple, uh, couple hundred feet higher uh, before that last eruption 6,000 years ago, and it lost a lot there. 
So here is a picture of all the glaciers. There are 26 named glaciers. This is what you would see today. Uh, the, the areas that are very, very dirty and gray, that's ice showing. And then up here in the upper part, the white areas, it still has snow from last year's uh, winter. And so he, here is again a picture of the mountain, the top of the mountain, and then the named glaciers that you have uh, got all over it. Emmons Glacier, the biggest glacier that you have got. It, 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 it actually comes all the way down in here, but it's covered up with landslides from the past. Uh, and, and so you don't see uh, the actual glacier that is there. On the right-hand side, a classic, what we call lateral moraine, showing that's where this was during the little ice age uh, a, a couple hundred years ago. Uh, and then here's the Nisqually Glacier, and it too is very, very dirty on the top, as many of the glaciers in the northwest are, from landslides that have come down. Here's your lateral moraine on this side, and the actual snout is down there at the bottom. And uh, there is a road that comes uh, with a bridge on it. I'll show you a picture taken from that in just a few minutes. And that's where the glacier was in the 1850s. Now it's retreated, retreated, retreated up around the corner. So this is a picture that I took from the, the actual bridge. And you see you have a braided stream in front of you, which is very, very common for having a glacier up there and the glacier is around the corner and it has retreated from here all the way up to there uh, uh, since the 1850s. Carbon Glacier is the lowest glacier in the lower 48 states. It's on the north side, uh, so it gets less sunshine. But secondly, it also has debris all, all over the top of it from landslides in the past and therefore is an insulating factor. Uh, if you go down through Stevens Canyon uh, to the east side, uh, you'll notice, look at all of these uh, areas cutting across with no vegetation cutting across the stream or the, the uh, highway that is there. Those are avalanche chutes and it's closed in the wintertime because snow avalanches come down, making it very, very dangerous to not only, well, to drive down, but also cross country ski. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Mount Rainier was considered America's most dangerous volcano. It's not because of ash. All of us think of uh, 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 Mount St. Helens and all of the ash coming out. It's mostly because of what we call uh, debris flows coming off and lahars. It, it, when the mountain is uh, erupting, it will melt a lot of the water that is there and, the, and also has a lot of weathered rock on the mountain. The water will combine with the weathered rock and all that slurry will go down into all the major streams and you will have major slurries coming down uh, the rivers. Here is Mount Rainier here and the major rivers coming off of the mountain and you can see all of the Lahar deposits going all the way down to the Puget Sound. Uh, and here's another map, the one going down in Enumclaw Claw. And Ording, the uh, uh, Enumclaw, that whole flat town down there is the Osceola uh, mud flow that came down 5,700 years ago during that major eruption. Uh, and then just 600 years ago, we had another one come off of the backside, and this was down into Ording. And the, all of those towns, and, and Auburn is another one, are all built on those. So here is Ording, that flat area down there. No, you say, that's a nice place to live. No, uh, if we have another eruption of Mount, Saint Hel or Mount, Mount Rainier, we have the potential for these mud flows coming down and completely filling up these valleys. So what you want to do is get up, uh, take the roads and get out of the valley. And we have a, a lot of uh, early morning systems that are there. Here's Cotts Creek uh, on the south side, right below Cotts Glacier. Uh, and um, back in 1996, we had a huge stream flow that came down here and, and scoured out this particular valley and rerouted it through this particular area here. Also, our volcanoes get some incredible uh, uh, cloud uh, formations. I love showing this one, um, and uh, I wanted to throw that in. So that is our first national park. Then we come into Oregon, and it was park number six out of 61 national parks in uh, 1902. That's Crater Lake, our national park here in Oregon. It's 28th most visited park uh, in the United States. Uh, and it's interesting, in, in, in 2016, it had many, many more. If you look at the Native American stories of how it created, you had Lao, who was the god of the underworld, and Skell, who was the god of the above world. And they were always duking it out back and forth and back and forth. And then the medicine man uh, of, uh, up in the Klamath area said, we need to stop this. And that was just all of the uh, eruptions of Mount Shasta and uh, also um, Mount Mazama, which was the previous volcano. 
and it, uh, they went up and they threw a young virgin into the volcano and it got scale so excited that he duked it out loud, rammed him into the ground, creating this huge hole in the ground. And that huge hole is where Crater Lake is today. It's a collapsed composite volcano. It is a caldera, a composite volcano. Those are mostly um, uh, andesite. And there'll be layers of, of uh, volcanic flows and then layers of ash, cinder, and lapilli from very violent eruptions. Uh, it is only now only about 78,000 feet high, but originally it was 12,000 feet in elevation. The lake there is 27 square miles. It's the deepest lake in the, lower, in the lower 48 states and the clearest lake in the lower 48 states. It's interesting. The price of visiting the national parks has gone up a lot. 2014, $5 for a car. Now it's $32 for a car. And the guy who led the formation of this park was William G. Steele uh, in Portland. He was a businessman. He was postmaster. He was a judge. But he also started the uh, mountain climbing group called the Mazamas, named after a mountain uh, goat. Uh, and, and hence the name, once it became a national park, they said the preceding volcano that was there, the collapse, uh, would be called Mount Mazama. Now, the first eruption of this volcano, it's a young one, 75,000 years ago. Uh, and the last one that came out, some of the books will say 6845. Those are radiocarbon years ago. If we go, if we convert it into calendar years, which we are now doing 7,700 years ago. And so here's a picture of beautiful Crater Lake, one of the most beautiful ones uh, that we have in the United States, the rim road that is going all around it. Here's Little Wizard Island. Uh, we are looking to the, the south and then the visitor center and the lodge is right in, in back of that. To get to it, you can either go down I-5 down to Roseburg and then go up and come in in the north entrance or go over Mount Hood down through Bend and then go th through Lapine and then come in through the north entrance. So easy to get to. When you get there, when you come in through the north entrance, you go across the Pumice Desert, which is up here. It, it, it still, after uh, 7,700 years, hardly any vegetation uh, that is in there. Uh, and then there's a rim road that goes around it. Wizard Island is here. The first place you'll see is going to be right in here. If you go to the north side of the lake, they have boat tours. I don't think they're running boat tours this summer. I didn't see on the website. Uh, and then one of my favorite... Uh, uh, additional volcanoes there, Mount Scott. That's my name. Uh, and then you go down here and you have the, the lodge that is here. Beautiful place to go uh, that is there. And I want to point out the pinnacles down in the southern part. Uh, this whole valley was completely filled up with pyroclastics. And, and then it is eroded away and leaving these hoodoos that are there. Very exciting. So you got to go see those. So let's take a look at that. So here we are looking at Wizard Island, which is a small cinder cone that came in after the, the uh, whole Crater Lake was created. And the back is this big, huge mountain called Lao Rock. Um, after God, Lao. Uh, and uh, it was an early eruption that occurred uh, a couple hundred years before the big eruption, 7,700 calendar years ago. And so here we are again looking at uh, Wizard Island. It's named after because it looks like the hat of Merlin the Magician, had, hence the name Wizard Island. Uh, and then look down here, there's Mount Scott, and look at these valleys here, U-shaped, another U-shaped. Those means that they were carved out by glaciers in the past because the mountain was much, much higher, 12,000 feet in elevation, and it had glaciers on it when it erupted 7,700 years ago. Here is a picture taken of Crater Lake in 1874 by one of the great early photographers, Peter Britt Jackson. Uh, and William Steele was growing up in Can Kansas and he saw this picture in the newspaper and he, and he said, I've got to go visit this. He moved to Oregon and the rest is history. And here's a picture of William G. Steele. Now is the Steele Bridge uh, named after him? Uh, I don't know. I think it is. Uh, but again, the Steele Bridge is all steel. So, but uh, it would be very befitting that it did. So what is a caldera? You have Mount Mazama that is here, huge eruption and much of the magma that is down underneath it goes out 
as ash and cinder and lapilli, and there's nothing to support the mountain. So the whole mountain collapses into it. This is what we call breccia. And then you have a big crater. That's the caldera. And then the lake forms in that. And then afterwards, you have Wizard Island and another little uh, uh, cinder cone that comes up. If you visit the visitor center there, they have a little replica. They say, here is the mountain, what Mount Mazama looked like before. You take it away, and then you have Wizard Island and Crater Lake as we have it today. So here is an artist's recreation of what the mountain probably looked like before. Absolutely beautiful mountain, very, very large uh, in the Cascades. And then afterwards, uh, then with everything collapsing in, that's what you have left. And if you looked at it from down below, um, this is what uh, you really can't see much because it's all gone. It's all uh, collapsed in. But that's what it would have like, looked like um, 7,700 years ago. Uh, it has a great lodge. I love the, uh, 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 the lodge. Uh, and again, a great cuisine. Uh, I don't think the lodge is open this summer, uh, but lots of college students are working there. Uh, in June, this is what it looks like when it opens up or just about ready to open up. And so a lot of people say, well, I'll go visit in early June. Well, there's a lot of snow up there. And a lot of times it's not open, the ring road. Uh, but here is the view from the, uh, from the lodge up there. Wonderful. Life doesn't get any better than sitting up there at sunset with a glass of Oregon Pinot Noir or a glass of, of Oregon Microbrew and looking out on the on Wizard Island Lau Rock off in the distance. If we take the water away on the left-hand side, you've got Wizard Island, but you also have Miriam Cone, another cinder cone, which is underneath the water out there. And you don't see that. And so we will, we'll, uh, uh, it was formed after Wizard Island. And so Wizard Island was formed here. There's also what we call a rhyodacite dome, a very, very thick uh, magma that came out as the lake was forming. And then you can see all the collapsed breccia down at the bottom. And, and then the glaciers from the past, look at the big U-shaped valley that is here. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, Phantom Ship is down here. I'll show you that. Uh, in just a second. And then if you go up into those U-shaped valleys, you'll see that the rock is striated. Glaciers, as they are going over the top of it, uh, may have a lot of rocks in the bottom of it, and they will grind into the rock below, showing the direction of the, the glaciers from the past. In the wintertime, it, it is an incredible place because that rim road around there becomes uh, open for cross-country skiers. And it is a great place to go up, cross-country ski around, and camp as you go. Here's a picture uh, of one of the trees right at the edge. And if you get a chance in the summertime, I encourage you to take the boat trip around the lake. They now have geologists on that, and so they can answer all of the questions, and you can really learn a lot. So what are some of the things you see? Well, you see Lao Rock, and then you can see the ash that came out before this huge lava flow came in just about um, 7,900 years ago. And then there's Phantom Ship, and the boats always will go around it. That is the oldest rock. That is a dike, uh, a volcanic rock that went into the heart of the volcano and has survived. Oldest rock that is there. Uh, and as you go around, you can also see some of these dikes. You can see here is the inside of the volcano. Some of it is pyroclastics. The fragments that come out of the volcano, ash, cinder, and lapilli. And then the other are lava flows. And then you have the magma coming out of the, uh, the center of the volcano and solidifying as it goes up into the cracks. Those are the dikes. Here is Castle Rock, which is also some of this magma coming up into an area. And then it's been hydrothermally altered, hot water, uh, into the beautiful cover, uh, color you have. And then there's also lots of ash that is up there from those eruptions in it. Uh, that have occurred in the past and a little debris flow for those of you who are landslide people. And then if you take the trip on the boat, the boat will always try and find old man of the lake. And if you're watching from above, you will see the, the boats go in a, 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 a counterclockwise manner, but all of a sudden it will go way out of the direction. And what you know that they are going to find this floating tree that has been it fell into the lake back in 1929 and you can see it still has a root wad on the bottom of, of it and uh and so you when you're there always ask the uh, boat captain are we going to go see old man of the lake and uh, they generally will do that and you can see how far away all of the ash went from this particular eruption. It was great, 40 times the size of Mount St. Helens. Uh, and so it is the biggest of the eruptions of the Caspian Cave volcanoes that we have got. There's a pumice desert uh, on the northern part. 
why the, having the trees come in, you can see a few there, that are there. <coughs> the reason is it is just, uh, there just isn't enough water to su sustain it because when, every time it rains or the snow falls on it, it, it goes down into the pumice and uh, it, it, the roots just it cannot sustain uh, life even after 7,700 years. I wanted to show you the pinnacle down at the end and you have these it, these are what we call hoodoos uh, and you can see the whole valley was completely filled up with pyroclastics from the huge eruptions and here are some more of these that are down there absolutely wonderful uh, this is down in Wheeler Creek Canyon and so what happened was uh, after this eruption this whole valley filled up with all of this pumice uh, but then there was water on the bottom from the snow that was there before. And it was, because the rock was so hot, it boiled it. And so you had all these steam vents, fumaroles coming up. Uh, and then it, they'd always go up in the same place. And they solidified the rock as they were going up. And those are the pinnacles that you have today. If you go up to Katmai National Park up in uh, uh, Alaska, uh, you will see the Valley of the 10,000 Smokes, which was exactly like this. And those, those pinnacles are forming up there. All right, let's go down to California. One of my favorite parks, and nobody knows about it. Mount Lassen, it's still 10th oldest park formed in 1916 because of a very, very large volcanic eruption. Not many people go and visit. 37 most visited one, only half a million people every year. And it looks like one of the classic uh, um, volcanoes, what we call andesitic composite or stratovolcanoes, but it isn't. It's a rock that has more uh, quartz and feldspar in it, and it's called dacite. It's halfway between andesite and rhyolite, which has lots of quartz and feldspar in it. Uh, and it's dacite, and it's the world's largest volcanic dome. And it is also the furthest southern portion of the Cascade Mountains. It's where the Cascades meet the Sierra Nevada. Where, where did the name come from there? Well, a, a famous, uh, infamous wagon train leader who was Danish, and I'm of Danish descent, so I like Danes. His name was Peter Lassen, and he was leading people uh, down from the Oregon Trail down into California, and he got them lost. And he couldn't find They were going to a place called Vina in California. Couldn't find it, couldn't find it. A guy named, a local guy, John Noble, came up, rescued them, took them down. And the, the, the last part of the trail is called the Noble Trail. And so when you're in the park, they will have pictures of that. Um, and then uh, in 1915, May 27th, they had a great eruption. And I'm going to show you some pictures of that. Uh, and that led to the National Geographic pushing this as a national park became one. Also, in that park, there are so many other volcanoes. There are shield volcanoes, which are like uh, very, very low angle type of volcanoes, mainly made out of basalt. There is a large caldera. The uh, whole center is there. Composite volcanoes. And you've got bump as hell, the uh, geothermal area. My, one of my favorite places in the park is Manzanita Lake. And it's closed right now. Um, uh, and I'm not sure why, the great campground that is at the far end. And there is Mount Lassen here in Chaos Crags, which is off in the, the background. Uh, but it is absolutely beautiful place. Uh, my, my wife was doing kayaking across this lake and a bald eagle came across and she said it was just a very inspirational moment. I love this particular place. Uh, here is a, a, a map of the park. So most people from Portland come in from the north entrance, and there is kind of a road that goes up around chaos jumbles, uh, then the devastated area from the 1950 interruption, and goes down to Summit Lake, and then, oops, I'm going to get back to this, and then you come down to the parking lot for Bumpus Hill. You got about a five to ten minute hike into Bumpus Hill. Lake Helen and Emerald Lake are down here. Here's Mount Lassen that is here. And then there is also some geothermal stuff down here. Sulfur Lakes here. Lots of great lakes in the back, uh, back area. Uh, and, and if you like backpacking, it's wonderful. Also, a perfectly formed cinder cone that is over here. And in order to see it, You've got to go out of the lake, go drive up around and come in there. Pacific Crest Trail comes right through this here. Uh, and then if you want to come in from the, the southern part of the Warner Valley, there are a couple guest ranches down there and also Boiling Springs Lake that is there. Uh, and so uh, most of the people just go in through here. The best camping site is Manzalita Lake. Let's see it.
And so here is a picture of the 1915 eruption. If you visit the visitor center, which is right next to Manzanita Lake, they have pictures of a photographer that took all of these things. Incredible. And then you had a whole bunch of eruptions from 1914, 1915 to 1917, but it was the 1915 eruption that came down uh, from the top and down to the, the bottom. Here is the, uh, the backside. The devastated area is still devastated. All the uh, vegetation has been wiped away from, by all of these incredible um, <clears throat> eruptions in the past. You're down at Manzanita Lake, there's Mount Lassen, the Chaos Jumbles. Chaos Jumbles is more day site that came out only just a few thousand years ago. Very, very young. And then we had a large landslide that came off of the Chaos Jumbles and came down uh, into the area and dammed up the creek forming Manzanita Lake. Uh, here's a picture from up on the top of Mount Lassen. Uh, again, the eruptions were uh, uh, 1914, 15, and 16, and 17. Uh, and then now uh, there, uh, there was a huge volcano, a whole uh, composite volcano called Mount Tehama. Uh, and it, it, it was gigantic. Uh, and uh, all of the remnants of the, the, this volcano uh, uh, are other uh, peaks like Mount Diller is one of them. Uh, and then here is Mount Harkness, which is a shield volcano down in the southeastern part that is there. Another one here is Broke Off Mountain. So Mount Tehama was a composite volcano. It had a huge eruption and then it collapsed into a caldera. Uh, and so mo that's the heart of that uh, caldera is Bumpus Hell, where there's still magma down below the surface. Uh, and so if you come, and so Mount Lass is off in the distance. Here is the parking lot at Bumpus Hill. Here is a glacial erratic that has been brought down by glaciers in the past. Uh, in, the, in the very, very back here is Lake Juniper, which is the largest lake here. A whole bunch of lakes that are out here, either formed by lava flows or by glacial um, uh, moraines that have dammed up the, the lakes that are there. If you like getting away, great hiking into the backpacking area. Or if you want to drive around and go to the perfect little cinder cone that is here. Parking lot is off to the left. We are looking to the south. You can climb up to the top, go around the top. And then uh, on the southern side, uh, you have got uh, a whole bunch of sand dunes that are down there from the cinder that came out. Uh, 800 feet high. And here is down in the, the painted dunes with a cinder cone off in the distance that is there. Uh, and then at the end of a lot of cinder cone eruptions, you have lava flows that come out. You can see the lava flow that came out on the left-hand side, came down, flowed over here, and dammed up some streams forming Snag Lake and uh, uh, the lake over here on the right-hand side. Uh, Bumpus Hell is this geothermal area that is there with what we call fumaroles or steam vents all over, boiling mud, boiling water that is everywhere. No geysers that are found there and lots of hot springs that are there. And you got a chance to see this picture earlier here. And you can go visit that. Why was it named Bumpus Hell? Well, a cowboy uh, who worked uh, down at the Dude Ranch uh, on the west end uh, or the uh, eastern side of the park would take people up here. Uh, and, and, and he would get out on, on some of the lava areas in between the fumaroles. He, now, you don't do this, but I, I'll be out here. I'll just show you how safe it is. And he fell in, got scalded, and it became his hell. And is named after him. Or you go out of the park and along the highway, and here are sulfur works. And there are a whole bunch of, uh, if you don't want to do the five to 10 minute hike into Bumpus Hill. Also, Boiling Springs Lake, which is possibly the world's largest body of hot water, uh, has interesting viruses that are living in here. Ken Segman, who's a professor at Portland State, who specializes in this, this is one of his favorite places to study the viruses that are there. All right, so those are our three big volcano national parks. Let's go up to Olympic National Park, uh, which is uh, up on the Olympic Peninsula, park number 25. No volcanoes here. Uh, it was originated, why? To save the uh, Roosevelt uh, elk that are here. Uh, and it is the seventh most visited park in the United States and the number one visited park in the Pacific Northwest. And it is three parks in one. You got the mountains, you got the coast, and then you have the whole rainforest that is found there. So it is a 
fun park to go and, and visit. Why is it named uh, uh, Olympic National Park? Well, one of the early explorers looked up and he said, it looks like the home of the gods, hence the name uh, uh, Mount Olympus. Uh, which is about 8,000 feet high, 60 active glaciers that are there. And all of this is rock that is just ocean bottom rock that has been stuck on. It's what we call accreted terrain that is here. And I'll show you that. Here are the Roosevelt elk that they are up there. Uh, the park is there to preserve them. We got a lot of Roosevelt elk down in the coast range here in Oregon. So here is the good old map that we have got. If you come up from Portland, one, uh, Portland, you get on Highway 1, uh, and you have two uh, Highway 101s. You can go up to Hood's Canal, up to Port Angeles, which is the main visitor center, or you can go up the coast after visiting Olympia, up uh, through Lake Quinault. I'm going to show you this here, a great lodge that is down there, through Queets. Uh, there's the Queets Rainforest, the Quinault Rainforest, and the Ho Rainforest, through Claylock. Uh, and then uh, uh, once you pass Claylock, this is Olympic National Park, too, uh, that you have got in this particular area here. So you've got the mountains. Uh, you, uh, you can go from uh, Port Angeles up to Hurricane Ridge. I'm going to show you pictures from Hurricane Ridge looking in to Mount Olympus, a beautiful U-shaped valley that is there. Uh, and then you can go up north to Lake Crescent, great lodge that is down there. Storm King Mountain, you had a large landslide that came down that created that particular area. Soldock Hot Springs, which is up in here, which you can visit. Whole Rainforest is down here. There's another visitor center down here in the beautiful rainforest. So you got the mountains, you got the rainforest, and then you got the incredible coastline. Very, very uh, rugged from Claylock up through La Pouche. And so the geology, very, very similar, simple. You've got uh, mostly basalt uplifted from the ocean bottom. It's just all pillow lavas coming from the Juan de Fuca plate. And then all of the sediments that are on top of it. It's called a melange. Uh, so sandstone shales and some basalt that is mixed in that is there. And so here is the one, if you can play it off of the coast as it comes in, it's got the basalt that is here, but all the sediment on top of it. And then it just gets shaved off uh, as it goes down into the trench here on the, by the North American plate. That's what uh, uh, Olympic uh, National Park looks like. Here's a picture of my son, and we've stopped at a whole bunch of pillow basalts as we have, uh, are on our road from Port Angeles up to Hurricane Ridge. An early group of geologists, it took them six months to cross the park uh, expedition in 1899. Geologists don't look like this with all these guns anymore. Uh, maybe the beards do, but uh, other than that, uh, that was one of the early expeditions uh, to, to do there. So here is Hurricane Ridge, great visitor center that is up here. Uh, and looking down into the beautiful U-shaped valley of Mount Olympus off in the distance. I love coming here in the spring right after the snow melts because all the alp lilies are out and it's really good. And I also love visiting here at sunset because hundreds of, of deer will come out of the forest and they are everywhere in the area uh, and are used to human beings. If you like camping, oh, that whole center part of the park, get away from it all. Lots of Ridge areas to visit and lots of uh, lakes that are out there. The lakes have either been formed by landslides from big subduction zone in the past or glacial moraines that have dammed up the lakes. Uh, and here is one that is Lillian Ridge and you can, that is a little glacial moraine. It, it, this is what we would call a tarn. Uh, and then you have beautiful glaciers, all those 30 glaciers that are up on the tops of all of the mountains. That's Mount Olympus up there on the top. Here is the very, very top. You can't, I cut off the two uh, uh, climbers up at the very top of Mount Olympus there. Uh, but this is all just uplifted seafloor material uh, that is found there. And so lots and lots of cirques, arets, and horns. Uh, those are uh, glacial features that are here. Uh, as a result of this area. And lots of glaciers. Here is a glacier, white glacier that is on uh, Mount Tom. Look at how gray it is. That means it's all ice. The snow from the winter before has all melted. Whereas in this picture here, given uh, 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 this particular glacier here, it's all, it's early in the season. Uh, and that is primarily s snow that is on top of the glacier that you've got here. As we go back out of the park and go uh, uh, to the coast, uh, 
Uh, here is uh, Lake Crescent that is up here. And it's formed by a large landslide that came out of Storm King Mountain uh, down here and dammed up the river here, uh, hence the lake that is formed here. Neat lodges that are around the edges. My favorite is Lake Crescent Lodge that is here. Storm King Mountain is off in the distance. Uh, but some great uh, uh, forest to hike in if you want to do the trail up to Mary Mirror Falls. Here is Mary Mirror Falls, absolutely beautiful place up there. Or if you want to go to Solduck Hot Springs uh, and the beautiful, and I think we showed this in the uh, question ones before the bridge that is going up there and that's the, the river coming out of that area. Then we get to the, the West Coast and the uh, whole rainforest. I mean, 142 inches of rainfall every year. And it's just marvelous to walk through all this moss and lichen the, and the trees that are there uh, and wherever you go. And, and you, uh, the whole and the Queets rainforest and the Quinault rainforest, great hiking. When's the best time of the year to go? Now. Uh, July, August, and September when it doesn't rain in the Pacific Northwest. The rest of the year, you're going to get wet. And also, if you want to go early in the spring, oh, the rhododendrons, absolutely beautiful, but you're going to get wet. And some great waterfalls that are found in that particular area, too. Wonderful place to go. The beach is completely different. Here's Claylock Beach, great campground that is down here. And as you go up the coast, I mean, it's very, very rugged coast. You cannot walk the whole area because a lot of the beaches are cut off uh, and eroded. Some ships, uh, there are a lot of shipwrecks that are along the coast too, very rugged. And remember, this is all uplifted sandstones and shales that are on the beach that you have got here. A lot of, of, of uh, rocks off of the coast. And here's Elephant Rock, uh, which is all eroded sandstones uh, from, that are uplifted. And look at this, this is washboard at low sea tide. These are all the sandstones that have all been turned on there. They're basically up and down. Um, uh, as a result of the uplift of this area. And then you get, get down to Lake Quinault. That's the furthest south rainforest that you have got. That's a glacial moraine that has dammed up that particular lake. You go around to the right-hand side, and you will have Lake Quinault Lodge. Absolutely beautiful place to grow. Great uh, uh, dining room there. Uh, it's much smaller than some of the other lodges that we've talked about, but a fun place to go and visit. And then a beautiful U-shaped valley, uh, just uh, to the east of the lodge, showing that that was filled by glaciers in the past. Then we go to the least visited park uh, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, North Cascades. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, it was only formed in 1968. Fifth, uh, only 20,000 people actually visit there. Not a lot of people drive through. And if you're gonna go from Mount Vernon to the east side, you, you take the highway through, but you don't have to pay. Very old rocks that are here, completely different from Olympic National Park uh, that we had there. To the two largest mountains, Mount Logan and Mount Shuxon, um, are found on the <coughs> west side of the park. And just outside of the park, Mount Baker is just right next to Mount Shuxon. And then Glacier Peak is uh, just to the west of the southern area. I eventually guess with time, Mount Baker and Mount uh, Glacier National Peak uh, Glacier Peak will become part of the uh, national park. Uh, Glacier Peak is one of the four violent uh, uh, volcanoes in the Cascades. You've got Mount St. Helens, Crater Lake or Mount Mazama, Mount Lassen, and Glacier Peak. When they erupt, they, the, the magma is much thicker and therefore lots of ash and cinder and lapilli that is coming out of that. Mount Baker, a typical uh, Cascade volcano, uh, primarily andesite, layers of, of, of andesite and pyroclastics, andesite and pyroclastics. But it's got glaciers galore. Uh, Frank Granshaw, when he did his uh, 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 PhD dissertation at Portland State, counted 600 or 316 glaciers. Now, another one of our, uh, our grad students at Portland State, a uh, young lady, na last name Gray, uh, she has calculated at the rate that they are all retreating right now, 93% of them will be gone by the year 2100. It, uh, many people call it the American Alps. Uh, and so there are th uh, here is a major road, Highway 20, coming from Mount Vernon all the way uh, going to uh, the east side of the mountains. And so that is not part of the national parks. And this is the Ross Lake uh, National Recreation Area, the big dam that is here. 
and uh, uh, and we'll show you some of the rock that is in this particular area. This is the north part of the uh, uh, of the national park. Mount Shuxon is here, and then Mount Baker is just to the west. Uh, and then uh, the southern part is down here. Mount Baker is just, uh, uh, no, sorry. But Glacier Peak is just to the west here. These are some of the large glaciers that you have got down here. I'll show you the Challenger Glacier, which is up in the northern part. And then a national recreation area, Lake Chelan is down here. Big U-shaped valley with a glacial moraine at the bottom that has dammed up Lake Chelan. You get on the boat and go all the way up to Stahican. Uh, and that is a national recreation area, not a national park. If you love getting away and wilderness camping, this is the park for you. Uh, either the going down to Mount Logan or up uh, to Mount Bloom. I mean, it is just an incredible uh, place to go. Here is a National Geographic depiction of this. We're looking to the west. Uh, here is Diablo Lake uh, formed by uh, a dam down here. And then there's Ross Dam that forms Ross Lake up in here. Uh, and then here's the picket range. I'm going to show you pictures of that. All they're what we call cirques and rats and horns, all of these uh, glacial features that are there and all of these glaciers that are found uh, up in all of these cirques that you've got. This is the north unit to the right, the south unit to the left. And this is the major highway you take from east to west. If we look at the geology that you've got, Right under Mount Baker and uh, Mount Chuckston, you've got sedimentary and volcano, volcanic rocks that are here. And then as you go to the east, you've got granite. Uh, and then you have schist and nice, very, very old rocks. These are what we call accreted terrain, stuck on. They were formed someplace a long way away and then stuck onto the North American um, uh, Continent. And then you can see major fault here at Ross Lake. And then you've got more uh, uh, granites and schist uh, 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 to the east. So major rock uh, um, segments from one side to the other. Years ago, I, I taught for one quarter at Western, uh, um, Western Washington University and the uh, professor of the um, uh, um, office right next to me, uh, Ned, he every weekend he would go off in search of the elusive uh, rocks and ophiolites that are found off in this area and trying to put together that we uh, have got there. So you, you've got here are glaciers filling the valleys in the past where the glaciers start up here. When they melt away, those are cirques. Uh, horns are the pointed mountains that you've got. Rats are the knife edge areas in between uh, glaciated valleys, U-shaped valleys that you have got. Here is Diablo Lake. This is uh, in the National Recreation Area with Colonial Peak in the, the background. Uh, and here, look at the color of the, the lakes that are here, kind of turquoise. That means that there's a lot of rock flower that is filling them. Uh, as the glaciers go over uh, bedrock, they have rock in the bottom. They grind against the bedrock and it creates silt. And that silt gets into the, the streams and that, that uh, light comes into the water it bends it to the uh, blue end of the spectrum, creating the turquoise colors you've got. This is what we call nice. This is just around uh, Ross Lake at the parking lot that is there. These are uh, boudinages. These are uh, zones of, of quartz and, and feldspar that have been injected into this nice, uh, highly high-grade metamorphic morphic rock in the past. Uh, then you get up into the north part, the picket range. Look at these arets uh, and the knife edges. Kind of hard to climb these particular areas here, glaciers in between. And uh, look at all these small cirt glaciers that you see here. How do we know that they're moving? All we look for is the bergschrund, the crevasse at the upper part where it's breaking away. If it's got a bergschrund, it's an active glacier. Uh, here is the Challenger Glacier that I talked about earlier, the biggest glacier up in the northern part. It's mostly gray because the, the snow from the winter before has mostly melted off. And then a little tarn, a little lake down at the bottom. Uh, here is Doubtful Lake. And this below is to Holly Peak. There's a beautiful glacier down here, some nice little moraines here. And this is Ice Dam. Uh, uh, this is a Glacial Moraine 2 holding that one back. Uh, just more cirques, arets, horns, and little cirque glaciers that are found in this particular area here. And then in the wintertime, not many people go up here. Why? You got avalanches, snow avalanches. Here's a classic avalanche shoot here, another one here, another one over here, another one over here. And there's a reason there's no forest here because snow avalanches have wiped them out in the past. Summertime is great. There's Bonanza Peak off in the distance, a gorgeous um, uh, 
uh, uh, horn that is there, Hidden Lake that is in front of you. Jade Lake, look at the color of that. There, it's got a lot of rock flower in that area there. And then look at, here's a lateral moraine from this tiny glacier that is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's still moving. There's, a, there's the Bergtrund at the upper part. Uh, and then uh, here's Mount Terror. Here's glaciers here. And you can see nice crevasses in the glacier. Ber good Bergstrand up there. Uh, and then here's Liberty Bell Mountain uh, up at Washington Pass. Um, here's Mount Shuckson. So we're now at the very western edge here. Uh, and this is primarily uplifted uh, ocean bottom sediments from the one that you could plate that you've got here. And then the major river coming off of that is the Nooksack River, and it goes all the way down to Bellingham area uh, that you see here. Look at that beautiful U-shaped valley. Uh, this is the Cascade River, U-shaped valley. Mother Nature shouting out to you that you have got a, U, a, a glaciated valley in the past. And then we go to the National Recreation Area, go around to the uh, eastern side. Uh, here's Lake Chelan. It is dammed up by a terminal moraine uh, of the glacier that came out of this valley. You hop on the, the boat, the Lady of the Lake, and then you uh, go up uh, to the end of the lake to Stahican, uh, and then you can hike. There are also a whole bunch of lodges that are up here. You can stay. There are church camps that are there, uh, and off of the distance, you can see Mount McGregor, Mount Buckner, uh, or you can walk over to Rainbow Falls, Stahican, at, uh, Stahican, and it's 312 feet high, huge waterfall, absolutely beautiful place. Here is a picture of the two volcanoes that I venture to guess will be in that uh, in the park soon. This is Mount Baker, a classic Cascade volcano, over 10,000 feet high, almost 11,000, and the Roosevelt Glacier coming off of it. Uh, and then here is Glacier Peak, which is down off of the, the southern section here, that explosive volcano that comes off of that. Last park that I've just kind of thrown in, kind of fun, is uh, park number 32. This is Redwood National Park. So you just go across the Oregon border down into California. 34th most visited park. More visitors are there. They can drive through, and you don't have, if you're on the major highway, uh, you don't have to pay. You can see the trees from a distance. But if you go to Lady Bird Johnson Grove and those things, then you got to pay. Uh, why was it formed to save the last 58,000 coastal redwoods uh, from uh, being logged? There were originally, they estimate, 2 million of these. And we mined them because uh, redwood uh, 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 just does not rot, rot very rapidly. These are the world's tallest trees, the largest trees. Now, you go up to Sequoia and Yosemite National Parks, they have mountain redwoods. They are fatter, but not as tall. Also, this is the southern part of geologically for the Pacific Northwest, a triple junction. This is where the Gorda Plate, uh, the southern extension of the Wanda Fu Plate, meets the Pacific Plate, meets the North American Plate, and this is where the San Andreas Fault goes off. So three major fault systems all coming together just off of the coast. Most of the geology here is uplifted melange, just like uh, Olympic National Park. It's called the Franciscan Formation. Landslides galore whenever they get uh, rainfall in there uh, that is there. Uh, so um, beautiful park, great creeks that are there. It's mostly along the coast because the fog dictates the distribution of the redwood trees because they need to have that fog uh, for a good portion of the year uh, to get a good deal of the water that they have got that is there. Uh, and then there's some state parks that are a part of this system as you take the highway going up, up, up the coast. Um, and got lots of pictures of the tall tree, trees. They are absolutely beautiful trees. Uh, here is the big tree here. Uh, and I got three pictures of Japanese tourists here. Uh, there's one. There's another one that yeah, where it got log, huge, huge trees that you got. And then there are drive through trees. Now, I got to tell you, there are five drive through trees there, four at the southern end and one at the northern end. Most Ar Oregonians go, come down from Gold Beach and go through it. The one at the northern one, when we visit, my wife said, oh, I gotta go visit this. We were at, at Gold Beach. She'd never been to the drive-through tree. So we did. Nobody else was there. And so she drove through and then she went back and did it again. I got videos of her going to two or three times. A lot of times there are a lot of people that are there, uh, but you, you have to pay. This is, they're generally outside of the national park, uh, but a lot of people love doing that. It, it's not a part of the park service. But hiking in the National Park is absolutely inspiring with all of the, the crushed up redwood uh, 
uh, on the uh, on the trails. Rhododendrons galore again in the spring. Lots and lots of them. The coast is absolutely beautiful. Very very rugged. Not too many beaches. There, here's one down at the bottom where, where the Klamath River comes into the ocean. A couple little sand spits that are there. So that is, those are the six national parks that I wanted to talk about in the Pacific Northwest. We have another one with, <clears throat> which became a national park uh, back at the beginning of the Obama uh, regime. And that is the Ice Age Flood Trail. Uh, and uh, it is now getting off of the ground. The Congress passed it, but they gave no money for it. They only had one half of a person. But the, the vision is there will be 14 visitor centers all the way from Milwaukee and Astoria all the way to Missoula, Montana. Uh, and we are working on one right now in Tualatin. So the one for the Portland area will be in Tualatin and we're working on the video for that uh, as we speak. Um, to talk about the Missoula floods, that is a whole nother lecture. It's one of the great stories of the Pacific Northwest, but that is the other national park that we have got. So, that is a story of the National Parks of the Pacific Northwest. Um, Melanie said, Scott, could you talk an hour? I've talked 59 minutes. And so I think it's uh, time for me to quit. And my aim is that all of you will get out and see our beautiful national parks and let Mother Nature talk to you. And hopefully you'll remember some of the things that uh, uh, we uh, I've talked about here. And if any of you are over 65 and you live in the Portland area and you want to take my class next spring, Email me, Burns S, B U R N S S, at pdx.edu, uh, and I will tell you more about that later. So, thank you very much, Omzi, for inviting me to come today, uh, tonight. And also at the end, donate. Normally, for these science pubs, uh, you have to pay money, and that money all goes to uh, OMSI, and this is a fundraiser for them. And so uh, OMSI is one of the great gifts to the Portland area and actually Oregon and Washington. And so I encourage you, uh, they will tell you later how to donate. So do that. Most of the parks that I talked about are open. The streets are open. Many of the visitor centers are closed right now. Uh, so go to the website uh, of those. Uh, and uh, also uh, Manzanita Lake is closed, as I, as I mentioned before. Also, another national park, huge alert for Yellowstone. All of the elk are, are mating right now. And bugling is galore. And they're telling people, don't go out after in the evenings when the, the bugling is going on. So that's the story. Uh, National Parks of the Pacific Northwest, thank you very much. We're going to open it up to questions. Wonderful. Ah, thank you so much, Scott. That was an amazing talk. Um, I learned so much. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I forgot my, well, I had the last, uh, the last the slide. I've already uh, stopped my share, but that is a picture of my family at sunset at Crater Lake out there and I was, I was gonna say, go out and visit the national parks. So I forgot that one. Well, right. that was a great description. I, I have it in my mind. Yeah, everyone go visit national parks. Um, we have already quite a few questions that have come in. Although I did wanna verbally answer one question both of us asked the air, which is the steel bridge is named because it is made of steel, not after Mr. Steel. So oh, thank you. that mystery has been solved. <laughs> um, now, Dr. Burns, you can help us solve some other mysteries. Our first question for you is, what causes hot springs to go cold? Um, oh, so a, a lot of times what will happen is water is percolating along a fault down to hot magma below, and then it recycles and comes back up. If you have an earthquake and it cuts off uh, the, the pathway for the, the water to get to the hot rocks, uh, then uh, it goes cold. And so generally it's some, what we call tectonic processes and earthquakes. Awesome. Um, our next question is vocabulary question. What is la, lapilli, lapilli? Oh, so, so anytime you have a volcano that erupts very, very violently, uh, the magma comes out and then it will uh, solidify and fall back down to the ground. The smallest particles are called ash. Uh, and then the next biggest ones, which are sand size particles, are cinder. When I was in high school, all of our tracks were red to go running on, and they were cinder tracks. And, and, uh, and it's very, very abrasive. And then uh, lapilli 
Uh, if you have a barbecue with volcanic rocks that are uh, one to two inches wide, that is lapilli. That's the size of the volcanic fragments. Great question. Nice. Is there, what's the name for the next size bigger than that? Uh, then you are up to volcanic bombs. <laughs> That's kind of a cool name. Is that, is that anything bigger? Does it, does the, do the, does the, do the terms change more than that? Yep. Yeah, no, no. It, once, once you're the vol volcanic bomb, you're done. And we, we have the same thing for sediments. You go clay is the smallest, then silt, then sand, then gravel, then cobbles, then boulders. So, I mean, we have okay. for all of those. Yep. Nice. Ah, more fun facts just thrown on in there. That's great. Um, what causes the colors in the painted dunes? Uh, so the, the different colors you got in the painted dunes at Mount Lassen are a result of uh, different weathering, different chemicals that are in them, first of all, and then different weathering regimes. And so most of those colors are yellow, orange, and red. Uh, and those are all uh, um, oxidation, different oxidation states of iron. So the redder ones are going to be hematite, then the, the more yellowish ones are going to be limonite. And so the, it's going to be primarily the irons of the ash that are coming out that is weathering and uh, different oxidation states. Good question. Um, if Mount Rainier erupted again, what would it look like for the Seattle area? So, and we're very, very concerned because it is probably a lower 48 uh, states, most dangerous volcano. But they will, if it erupts again, they will evacuate all those people in Enumclaw and Orting and Auburn. Um, uh, and but they, have huge, they have cameras and gauges and they will be monitoring all the streams for lahars coming down. The, uh, how, what, how do you describe a lahar? Well, you have a lot of water. Uh, and then a lot of sediment in it. And it's just like a slurry, just like concrete and moving very fast up to 45 miles an hour. And uh, if you've been in any of those towns at rush hour, it's a traffic jam. Uh, and so uh, they were very, very concerned that we get people to higher elevations uh, for them. But it's not going to be a lot of ash like Mount St. Helens. It is going to be primarily uh, the Lahars coming off. Good question. Yeah. Um, our next one, are the features of American rainforests similar to others around the world? Like uh, so there, so the rainforest is, is, is defined by the amount of rainfall every year, but then also latitude, your latitude changes. If you go down to Brazil, to the Amazon, the rainforest down there has completely different vegetation than we do here. And so our rainforest is primarily Sitka spruce, dug fir, uh, Western hemlock. Uh, and then as you go further north, then the vegetation is going to change. So latitude plus rainfall is going to dictate what vegetation. Great question. Yeah. Um, our next one involves some current events. Um, how much of Redwood National Park is left since the recent fire? Do you know? Uh, well, the, the recent fire that hit was actually a state park that is uh, between Santa Cruz uh, oh. and, and San Jose. And I visited that and it is just, it broke my heart uh, what, what happened there. Uh, uh, further, up, uh, further up north is where most of the, uh, uh, there are more national parks uh, further up north. Um, uh, Muir National Monument is just north of uh, San Francisco and then you go to the national parks uh, once you get up uh, further north. And so okay. they have not been hit by the forest fires. So it, was, so it was a different, it was a different Redwood Park. Is that the one that was founded by women? I think there was like one that was like a bunch of women were like, this is our park, Redwoods. Uh, that's a good question. It, that could have been can't, uh, Muir, but, uh, but I, 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 I've, I've forgotten which one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, big, that was Big Basin uh, oh, okay. was, was the one that it got hit by the fire. Yeah. Um, what is the best time of year to go to Lassen National Park, in your opinion? Uh, so the, for me, uh, the best time to go is after the snow is melted. You know, this is a higher elevation. Uh, and, and so generally July, August, and September. Uh, and then if you're lucky, October. But those three months, those are the ones where you can get around. If you like backpacking, the snow is melted. I, I get away, get off of the, the roads. But I mean, if you can't get away, 
uh, the, 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 the major road going through that, you can see most of this area and it's wonderful. It's beautiful, majestic. Yeah, I was there last August. It was early inspiring. Um, let's see. Someone wants you to elaborate a little bit more about the ice trail and the national. There's a, okay. There's a few questions about the ice trail. I'm going to kind of give them to you. So maybe you'll paint a picture. Um, can you elaborate a bit more about the ice trail and also will it be a national park or remain a national geologic trail and sort of a sub question will it have its own passport stamp? Yeah. For- it already has its own passport stamp. Oh. Uh, and so each one of those visitor centers will have the passport stamp. If you right now, our visitor center for Portland is at the Tualatin library, which is closed. Oh. But if you went in, they actually have the stamp uh, for this. Okay. And so uh, it is, um, it, it is called the ice age uh, flood geologic trail. And, and so we have the, uh, the, the Missoula floods, the classic Missoula floods, 15 to 18,000 calendar years ago, uh, over 16,000 square miles in the Pacific Northwest. That is the, those are the classic ones. But then we found that the floods actually uh, were all the way through the last 2.8 million years. Uh, and so we call those, those older ones um, uh, 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 part of the ice age floods. Uh, uh, and, and, and so uh, so we have ice age floods are all of the floods. The Missoula floods were primarily 15 to 18,000 years ago. Um, and it's the new concept. Uh, and so it is part of the national park system. It's right now uh, listed as its own thing. Uh, but, uh, but the national park service is, is said it is going to be a national park. Uh, and so it officially will go into it. And so I didn't, I mentioned it tonight, uh, uh, and you get a chance. Uh, well, I rewrote the book called Cataclysms on the Columbia. You can buy that and get learn all about it uh, and then uh, and then follow it all the way from Astoria all the way up to Missoula. Awesome. That sounds really fun. I definitely want to try that out. Um, quick reminder, everybody watching that uh, you can put your questions in the comment section if you have any old questions at all. Um, I have a follow up question about the Painted Hills for you. Um, are the Painted Hills of Oregon geologically unique from the Painted Dunes in Lassen? Um, and like other types of the colorful min- mineral striations, are those always sort of the same? Or are they- so, pa- Painted Hills, oh, I love the question. Uh, because uh, Painted Hills are part of the John Day Fossil Beds uh, National Monument. And it, I think it's one of the most beautiful places in the state of Oregon. And you see all these red and gray uh, layers. Those are all buried soils. Uh, and, and they are all buried by volcanic eruptions uh, starting 42, 43 million years ago, all the way through maybe 25 million years ago. And so you had very, very active volcanoes out there, and, but you also didn't have the Cascades. So Eastern Oregon was just as wet as Western Oregon. Uh, and so you had uh, very, very thick forest vegetation. And, 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 and then what happened is the iron that is in the, the soils is translocated by all of that water moving down through it, creating what we call a BT horizon, that red layer. And then you would have a volcanic eruption that would bury that whole thing by maybe two or three feet. Uh, and, that, and then you would have a new soil formed in it. And so you kept on restarting the parent material with it. So it's different from down at... Um, uh, Lassen, which is one volcanic eruption over a, a, a very short period of time, maybe 10, 20, 30 years, uh, and then uh, different weathering states of, of that cinder, uh, ash, cinder, and lapilli that came out. Whereas this other one, we're talking millions of years of bu- burial um, uh, by all of these volcanic uh, eruptions that are there, and those are the soils. Great question. Oh. That's amazing. Yeah, that was a great question. And that was that was uh, that was all discovered by Greg Ritalik, a absolutely world famous vol, uh, vol- uh, 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 professor of geology down at University of Oregon. Good friend of mine. Nice. Um, okay. Ooh, we got a flood of questions coming in since I made that call. Okay. Let's see. Doop doop doop. Um, is there still a glacier in Great Basin National Park? 
Oh, oh, I love it. So Great Basin National Park is off in Nevada. Uh, and it's on the eastern side of, uh, of, of Nevada. And a beautiful valley that is there. And it's got a lot of sediment on the top of it, uh, rock on the top of it. And it's, it's a big debatable thing. I, I've checked with Andrew Fountain, our glacial specialist in our department. He said, no, it's dead. Uh, and so it is a rock glacier that is on top of, uh, of the where the it, it's in a cirque. It looks like a glacier in the wintertime, has a lot of water and uh, or a lot of snow in the spring. You look at it. Oh, looks like a glacier. It is moving because the old ice underneath is slowly moving down. But uh, he said it is kind of stopped. So uh, it does not have a bergschrund. So it is not a glacier. Oof. Um, and then that person had another question in the same sort of thing. What is the rock they have at Lehman Caves? Was it long ago formed on the coast? Oh, I love it. So, so also at that same park, um, uh, Great Basin National Park, you have got Lehman Caves, uh, which is, is, is limestone. Now, limestone is always formed, or most of the time, especially in large sequences like this, it was flat and then got tilted. And so the caves are in that, and it is always formed in a warm ocean. Uh, and so, yes, it, uh, Lehman Caves was underneath the ocean uh, and a warm ocean a long time ago. Then it was uplifted uh, and tilted. And then most of that erosion of, of the caves and uh, formation of the stalactites and stalagmites, which are wonderful, was done during the last two million years during the glacial periods. We had more rainfall in the western half of the United States. And I love picking your brain, you know, a little bit about everything. Um, can you, this is maybe more of a chemistry question, can you explain the difference between calendar years and radiocarbon years? Oh, I, yes, it, and it's great because, um, um, so we always, when, when we, I send something off to be dated, I always get it back and the lab will always, uh, um, they look at the amount of radiocarbon that is in the um, substance versus the atmosphere. And, uh, and with time, if, if after something dies, uh, that radiocarbon will break down into daughter products and they, they measure how much of the real material is there versus the daughter product. And, uh, and, and so um, you have, uh, because we have had a lot of atomic bomb blasts, we put more radioactivity into the atmosphere. We've kind of played around with this. And then what we have done by looking at trees, if you, uh, we, we know the, the rings are one per year. If you go back in time, you take a tree uh, and you date that ring and then you find another tree that has, that's older and you keep going back in time. The, um, the, uh, Tree, the, the specialists, tree ring specialists have done this and they had gone back 15,000 years and they have found that uh, if you date those tree rings uh, that are 15,000 years old, they come out being a lot less, maybe like 12,000. Uh, and so, so we have two curves going back in time. And so when I get something radiocarbon dated, they give it in radiocarbon years, but then they say, this is the calendar year. So now what we do is we always report calendar years in the popular publications. Nice. Um, okay. Can you find sea fossils on any of the mountains? I'm not sure if they're talking about specific mountains or not. Oh, uh, well, so yes, you can up in the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, you, you can see some uh, fossils, clamshells and things like that. Not real common, uh, but you can, especially uh, Olympic National Park. And then also uh, the Franciscan Formation uh, down in Redwood uh, National Park. You can see that. Uh, as far as the other ones, they're mostly volcanic sediments in all of the rest of the parks. Uh, North Cascades, yeah, in Mount Shuxon, uh, you might be able to do that too. Cool. Um, now here are a question about two places I have never heard of. So maybe if other people are like me, you can give a little background of where, where these places are. Um, how were the Steens Mountains formed as well as the Alvord Desert? Oh, I love it. So the Steens Mountains are in Northeast Oregon and Wallowa Lake is down at the bottom. 
Uh, and, and so all of the Wallawas are uplifted, accreted terrain. So if we go back 150 million years ago, there was no Oregon. It was all underneath the ocean. But you still had the, uh, the much larger plate called the Farallon Plate being subducted underneath North America. But sometimes you would have an island on it or some, uh, and that island would not be subducted and go down underneath and it gets stuck on. Uh, and th that's what we call accreted terrain. Uh, and so all of the, the, the Blue Mountains uh, and the Steen, uh, sorry, the Steens are down south. I'm up in the Wallawas. Okay. So the Wallawas are all accreted terrain. Let's I'm happy back. to hear about those too. Cause all right. I so I told you about the, uh, the, the Wallawas and the Blue Mountains. Now let's go about down to Southeast Oregon to the Steens Mountains, Steen Mountains. Uh, and, and so those are all basalt. That is where the hot spot that uh, uh, was uh, starting about 17 million years ago until maybe about 12 million years ago. North America has moved across at that hot spot where magma is coming from down in the mantle to the surface. That uh, hot spot is now underneath Yellowstone National Park causing the explosive uh, volcanoes that we have got there. Uh, and so it has been uplifted along a major fault. That's part of what we call the basin and range uh, uh, area. And so the Albor Desert is part of the part that goes down. That is what we call the Graben. And then the Horst is the part that goes up. And so the Steens are a horse that's uh, uplifted basalt that was formed 12, 15 million years ago. It's the same, a very, a very close cousin to the Columbia River basalt, which is the uh, uh, rock that we have around here. Lenny, could you turn on the light? Uh, and, and I'm in the dark. Uh, and, and so the Alvar Desert uh, is dictated uh, because it's very, very dry over there. Uh, and, 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 and that is between the Steam Mountains and where uh, the, the southeast corner of Oregon is. And uh, it is a desert. And it is very, very dry. It's got playas. It's also got a hot springs, Mickey Hot Springs that is out there. A little, a little geyser, too. Wow, that sounds incredible. I've never been to that area. It's neat. Um, okay, here's a longish question. Um, I've heard that Mount Rainier is the tallest mountain in the world if you look at change in relief, that it starts just above sea level and goes up 14,000 plus feet, whereas the mountains in the Himalayas start at a higher elevation. I guess, is this true? Well, it depends upon all your definitions. I mean, the, the world's largest mountain is actually Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea in Hawaii. If you go all the way from the bottom of the ocean all the way to the top, it's oh, over yeah. 30,000 feet. Uh, and that's vertical relief. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, but, you know, going, I mean, I mean in, the, in the Himalayas, down uh, at the very, very bottom of Mount Everest, you're still 25, uh, 20 to 25,000 feet in the elevation. So you do have some uh, good vertical relief, but it's not as much as, for instance, in Hawaii. But if you go just from the uh, valley bottoms of Rainier all the way up to the top, I don't think you've got the, the same vertical relief that you've got there. You're going up uh, to 14,000. So you do have a lot of vertical relief if you do go from sea level all the way up there. Yeah. Um, are hot springs generally safe to swim in and what's the likelihood of water getting super hot all of a sudden? Yeah. So what you have to do is monitor the hot springs. And if you've got it, if you, if, if it is a wild one, you've got to put a thermometer in and see what the temperature is. Uh, and, uh, generally most of them are pretty consistent uh, with the temperature because it, it, it's water that is flowing from uh, an area with the hot rocks down below uh, to the surface. A lot of hot springs are way too hot to sit in. And, and, and some of the hot springs that we have here in Oregon, especially up in the Cascades, they actually dilute it with cooler water to make it, you know, 103 degrees uh, for us. Uh, and so every hot spring's different. Every hot spring's different and the temperatures that you've got depends upon the depth of the water down to the hot rocks that you got below, below the surface. So you mentioned that it's, it's more typical for them to maintain temperature. Is that so? Are they usually more of a, a straight temperature instead of fluctuating wildly? Yeah, in, in general, that is the case. But sometimes if you have 
An earthquake. Um, I still remember uh, the movie a few years ago, Dante's Peak. Uh, they had a hot spring that went really hot, really fast. I don't know if that is real common. <laughs> um, okay. If we had the big one, the really big earthquake, would it cause volcanoes in the area to also blow? And that is always a good question uh, because a huge magnitude nine earthquake, uh, is it going to cause them to go? What we have done is look back um, in the geologic record. And we now know for the last 10,000 years, the dates of most of these large earthquakes that we have had. And then we look for volcanic eruptions in the Cascade volcanoes, and we really have not seen uh, any of those. And so uh, uh, with similar dates. Um, now, the, the last five uh, subduction zone earthquakes that have occurred in the wor world, starting with Anchorage in 64, and then Indonesia, mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, Chile and Tohoku, the lo those last four, there were no volcanic eruptions that were associated with them. So in general, what we say, most likely not, but then maybe it, sometime it will, but we don't have any good evidence. Well, that's a little bit of a relief, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that Olympic National Park was formed to preserve the Roosevelt elk. Do they only occur in the Olympic Peninsula or are they more broadly elsewhere in the U.S.? So the, the Olympic, uh, so the Roosevelt elk are from all the way from the Canadian border all the way down into Northern California. So <clears throat> when you, um, you go into the coast range, we have huge herds, herds now of uh, Roosevelt elk that we have got here. So yeah. Range is much bigger now. Um, what is the relationship between volcanoes and megafauna? So um, megafauna are going to be uh, things like mastodons, mammoths, uh, saber-toothed tigers, the, the really big ones and, uh, that are, uh, were found in the fossil record in the past. Uh, and they were here, and some, some examples have been buried by volcanic eruptions, and we have found some of them. Uh, I don't know of many in the Pacific Northwest. We, most of the megafauna that we have found have been buried by the Missoula floods. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it is possible that there may be some that are out there. I don't know uh, about them. Bill Orr. Our uh, famous paleontologist, fossil guy for University of Oregon, would know better, much better than me. Well, um, if Mount Rainier erupted, would it have a pyroclastic flow? It, it could have a pyroclastic flow. First of all, what's a pyroclastic flow? Uh, yeah. Pyroclastic flow is uh, generally coming from really, really explosive volcanoes, like Mount St. Helens, like Glacier Peak, like... Uh, uh, like Mount Mazama, like Mount Lassen. Uh, and, and those eruptions that I showed you from Mount Lassen uh, back in 1915, that was a pyroclastic flow. It is a uh, eruption that has very, very heavy, dense air coming off of the glacier and coming down into the valley, but it has lots of ash and cinder in it. Uh, and so it incinerates everything on the way down. And so the chances of a pyroclastic flow coming off of Mount Rainier are probably pretty low because it's a gentle giant. It's like Mount Adams. It's like Mount Hood. Uh, it's like Mount Jefferson. Those are all volcanoes that are not really super explosive. But those four that I mentioned, Glacier Peak, Mount uh, St. Helens, Crater Lake or Mount Mazama, and Mount Lassen, those are the ones that you really have the pyroclastic flows. Um, is it true that the source for heat of hot springs is radioactive decay? Well, the, the, the source of hot, it can be uh, for hot springs. Uh, and uh, as, as you go down deeper into the earth, you have more and more uh, radioactive materials. You go to Hot Springs, Arkansas, for instance. There is no volcanic activity around there, but you have a major fault and as you go deeper into the earth, the, the rock is heated up. And that's mostly related to radioactive uh, decay that you have got. 
Uh, and uh, whereas most of the other hot springs we have, it's hot rocks that are down there. And it's magma that is there. Uh, that is heating, and the water goes down to it and then comes back to the surface. Great. Um, ooh, I like this next question. Uh, in your opinion, is there any other location in the Pacific Northwest um, that should be designated as a national park and why? Well, in, as we talked about, I would like the official stamp for the Ice Age flood the geologic trail to be a official national park. It's, it's quasi. Okay. Um, and uh, I don't, I don't think there is anything national park, but I uh, national monuments. I was thinking about this today in Fort rock, which is in Eastern Oregon. Uh, I really think it, it, it's a Mar volcano. It erupted into a lake. Uh, it has some of the oldest archeological sites around. Uh, I think it would be an absolutely great national monument that we have got. But I, I don't really want to uh, expand too many other national parks that we have. And so I, I can't see any right now. Uh, maybe upgrading Mount St. Helens from a national monument to a national park is a possibility that you've got there. Um, but uh, I, the rest of them, I think the size of the national monuments is good. Keep them there. And, uh, so I wouldn't say I think of any right off the bat. Is there, if I widen that to be generally in the U.S., is there any that springs to mind that you think should be a national park? Oh, and I have thought about that. And uh, uh, most of the ones have, uh, that I think are really exciting geologically, well, it's interesting, like 95% of all of the national parks are there because of geology. Uh, and then you have like Swarrow and Redwoods uh, National Parks and the Joshua Tree are there for the uh, uh, plants and trees. Uh, and I, I can't think of any that I would really push to do it. Now, uh, about half of the state of Alaska, I think, should be uh, a national park. Oh, it is so beautiful. It, it, uh, so beautiful. And Utah. Oh, there are so many places in Utah that could easily be a national park. Um, and so those are some of the ones that I think could be very exciting. Yeah. Um, ooh, here's another opinion question. Um, do you think there's been too much logging in the Olympic National Forest area? And if so, what's the long-term outlook on ecosystem, especially considering our warming climate? Well, it, it's very, very important. <clears throat> uh, first of all, in the Pacific Northwest, we've done a pretty good job of, you know, if we do log, we try and get trees right back on it right away. And the law basically in, in both of our states really try and do it. The problem is sometimes companies log everything and they go bankrupt and they are not required to plant back. Yes, we do need to plant. And there was an article just this last week said if we plant a trillion trees around the world, we could have a significant impact on climate change. Uh, and I would love to see that happening. And uh, all of us can do our point by uh, part by planting trees. So yes, it, planting trees, very, very important. Yeah. Um, where is the oldest exposed rock in the Pacific Northwest? Um, whoa, it's got to be some of our accreted terrain. And I don't know of Northern uh, Washington as a, but in Oregon, it's out in the John Day area. Uh, and, and there are ammonites, I mean, uh, which are what we call Paleozoic. Uh, that are found out in that area. And most of Oregon is very, very young rock speaking, you know, it's less than 100 million years old. And that back there is over uh, 350 million years old. So, uh, uh, so the John Day area has the oldest rocks for Oregon. Awesome. Um, okay. A lot of rivers flow from the base of Crater Lake, like the Klamath and Rogue and Umpqua, et cetera. Um, but the water level of the lake never drops. Where does the water flow for those rivers come from? Yeah, and, and the U.S. Geological Survey and a guy named Charlie Bacon, who studied uh, 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 Crater Lake for years and years, has looked at that. <clears throat> they believe underneath the ground that there is a sill. You remember I showed a couple of those uh, deposits on the inside of the volcano that is kind of acting as a dam. And, and so the water level goes up to that and then it heads down towards Klamath Falls and the Klamath 
basin. Uh, and, and, and so they, they tagged the, the water from the lake and they found it in, uh, down in the Klamath Basin. Uh, and it, it means that it maintains that same depth just because of probably the sill that is underneath it. Uh, and then may, uh, the water goes down primarily down into that area. Great. Um, it looks like we are coming to the end of our time. We have one question that you had answered way at the beginning of question and answer. So maybe you can do just a little review uh, but how are the Oregon Painted Hills formed? Well, I, I talked about that earlier. And those are a successive volcanic eruptions, one after another, after another, maybe from uh, 25 to 42 million years ago. And those are the soils that you have got formed in the forests um, uh, back at that particular time. It was very, very wet. And you had a lot of translocation and movement of iron down in the and then a new volcanic eruption would come on, new materials. And, and so you've got unweathered volcanic material, weathered volcanic material, weathered, none weathered. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much for your vast array of knowledge. Um, you answered a lot of different questions and your talk was incredible. Um, and, and thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for handling this, too. Thank you to Sean. I thought he did a great job of answering the questions at the beginning. And thanks to all of the people who have uh, listened today. And it's, it's wonderful. And again, please support OMSI. Uh, and, uh, and support your national parks, too. And support your <laughs> national support everything. Parks. Yeah. Um, especially right now, going outside is one of the safe things to do. So definitely... Go to those wonderful, beautiful outside places. Well, thank you, Dr. Burns. Um, that is all the time we have for tonight. I hope everyone enjoyed tonight's event. If you'd like to watch the video again or share it with your friends, you can check out the video section on OMSI's Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for updates on future events and inspiring content from OMSI. And I know I mentioned it at the beginning, and Dr. Burns has mentioned it too, but please consider supporting Science Pub or making a donation via the Facebook donate button, or you can visit omzi.edu slash donate. Or you can get one of those sweet little Science Pub pint glasses too, to enjoy your beverage um, for future Science Pubs. Uh, speaking of future Science Pubs, you can join us again in two weeks on Tuesday, September 22nd. Oh, I'm really excited about this. For a lecture about star-nosed moles, electric eels, tentacles, snakes, and even zombies. Um, Ken Catania, professor of biological sciences at Vanderbilt University is gonna describe the often unpredictable path that leads to scientific discoveries while demonstrating that most animals have incredible hidden abilities that can defy our imaginations. Um, I'm super excited about that one. So once again, thanks to our partner, Stellastream, for making tonight's event possible. And as always, you can get more information on our website at omzi.edu. So thanks everyone and have a wonderful night.